Hi, this is Robert Rapier from R Squared, and this is R Squared Energy TV. In this week's episode, I've got questions about peak oil and about carbon emissions trading markets. So first question, what do you make of all the recent announcements that uh, the peak oil myth has passed and that peak oil has now been discredited? So there have been a number of articles in the last couple of weeks. Um, first, there was an article in Nature that said oil's tipping point has passed. And in response, we got a lot of, uh, Bloomberg had a story that said peak oil scare fades as shale and deep water wells gush crude. There was a, an article in Forbes about the peak oil myth. Uh, there was the unfounded fear of the peak oil monster in U.S. News and World Report. Uh, my friend Chris Nelder tried to make sense of it all in an article he wrote called The Politics of Peak Oil. So what does this all mean? The, the people writing these articles, it, it sort of reminds me of uh, Baghdad Bob in the first Iraq war who would go on TV and he'd say, uh, you know, everything's under control, there are no troops in the area. The, the problem is, you know, about all these peak oil arguments declaring that peak oil is, is dead and discredited, oil prices are still at $100 a barrel. So oil prices are not, are not signaling that we're swimming in oil. It, it's true that oil production, like in the U.S., oil production's been on the rise, but it's also true that China and India are growing and, and consuming, uh, you know, incremental oil capacity that comes online. And so I've talked about peak oil in those sorts of terms for years, that peak oil is really the inability of supply to keep up with demand. So in that case, not my scenario that I call peak light, which meant that we could have the sort of impacts of peak before we actually got to a physical peak. So the focus on physical peak may not be uh, accurate. As, as uh, you know, oil has increased at 10 times the rate of inflation over the past 10 years. That is amazing. And that's, that's saying, that's suggesting something is going on. And I think it means that excess capacity is all gone. Um, there's not much left in the world. And whether we've peaked or not, <clears throat> we are feeling the implications that we will when oil actually peaks, whether it's this year, next year, or you know, five years, 10 years from now, I think we're in a new era where uh, we are dealing with the, the implications of peak oil, um, whether, whether people can point to a little bit more oil production or not. I mean, as long as oil prices are where they are and continuing pressure, um, uh, upward pressure, then we have a problem. Okay, can you do an episode on your view on the topic of pricing climate risk with emphasis on the charging of CO2 emissions as a potential way to reduce our carbon footprint? Uh, and this question is for emissions on a global scale rather than just in the U.S. or Western Europe. I don't believe there will ever even be a mandatory carbon trading scheme in the U.S. Uh, because there's just too much political opposition. And I certainly don't believe that China is going to get on board with that. Um, you know, these, these uh, uh, global warming conferences that they have in, you know, these places, uh, Copenhagen and Durban, uh, you know, they, they, they turn out to be kind of circuses because all these people are, are looking out for their own agenda. And the emerging countries, you know, they rightfully say, you know, we should have the ability to develop with fossil fuels just like you did. So uh, I've always said that we really lack the moral authority in the U.S. when we're using 20 barrels of oil per person per year to try to tell China how to develop without fossil fuels or to, to tell some of these developing countries how to do it. We don't have the blueprint. We can't show them how to do it. Um, so I really believe that they will continue to emit more. The Asia Pacific region right now emits uh, far more than the U.S. Or in fact, more than the U.S. and the EU combined. And by the end of the decade, they're on a trajectory that will take them to 50 percent of all global carbon emissions. So I don't think they're ever going to put a scheme in. Now, one, one scheme that's been suggested, uh, Jeff Rubin suggested this in his book, uh, Why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller, that if countries who import products from China and from uh, some of these countries that don't produce uh, GDP very efficiently, and that's China, you know, some of the things that we outsource to them, they produce very inefficiently using a lot of coal, if we had an import tariff based on the embedded carbon dioxide in the, uh, you know, in the products that we're importing, that would provide an incentive for them to, to get more efficient. But just simply, uh, you know, them unilaterally or some kind of global agreement, I don't believe it's going to happen. I don't think China's going to do anything that's going to slow their growth down. 
Uh, they're not slowing down on their, on their coal-fired power plants. They're building them just as fast as they can. So I think you'll see China's emissions continue to rise, and, and I don't think they'll be interested in a, in a carbon emissions trading scheme. Uh, one, one point that I would make, you know, a lot of people will, I, I've just written about this in my book, about the, uh, some people use, an, use the analogy of the sulfur trading markets as, uh, you know, a, a model of success, and this is how the carbon trading markets can work. The sulfur trading markets in the U.S. did work very well to reduce sulfur dioxide and to stop acid rain. But sulfur is very different. Sulfur is a very localized problem. So sulfur only lasts in the air a few days. So emissions in a coal-fired power plant in, in the you know, southeast U.S. is not going to impact sulfur dioxide over China. And it's not going to contribute to uh, you know, a, a long-lasting global uh, SO2 or sulfur dioxide concentration that's, that's climbing. It's not going to affect it in that way. So uh, uh, it, it became, you know, it's more of a local problem. So the U.S. passed laws in the U.S. that fix that problem. You know, CO2, even if we get our CO2 completely under control, uh, you know, the global nature of the problem is that doesn't mean that the, the emissions globally are going to be impacted at all. Um, so th that's, you know, that's my feelings on the, on the carbon emissions markets. I think they, uh, uh, you know, they, they, I don't think they were working very well in Europe. I think the, uh, what really brought carbon um, emissions down in Europe was, was very high prices, and that's also what happened in the U.S. So, uh, um, you know, just gas prices going up uh, eventually caused people to conserve a little bit more, and that caused emissions to go down. I don't know that a carbon emissions trading scheme, which is really an indirect way of trying to increase fuel prices without... Um, uh, you know, the, the government taking the blame. I, I really, I've always looked at that as kind of trying to shift the blame onto industry uh, with the carbon emission trading schemes. Uh, oh, the, the other point about the uh, sulfur markets is uh, sulfur was a point source, uh, was much more of a point source coming out of power plants than uh, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide comes out of power plants, but also comes out of cars all over the place. And so it is very much harder to have pollution control equipment that takes carbon dioxide out of the air when it's being emitted by all these cars than it was uh, in, the, in the sulfur trading markets. So there are a couple of very big differences there between that and the, uh, and the carbon markets. So with that, that concludes this week's episode. Please uh, tune in next week. If you have questions, please send them in. Thank you. Bye-bye.